I welcome her to the stage to make, his, make her speech. Good morning. Um, I can't see you with these, so I'm going to keep flicking back and forth. I'm sorry. Um, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. So as you know, I'm from New Zealand, and that's a Māori greeting. I've basically just said, hello, everybody, and I've sort of welcomed you to my talk. Um, I'm, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I want to think, thank everyone um, who's... Who, I want to thank everyone for the in, invitation, but I'd also like to thank everyone who's looked after me um, so far since I arrived yesterday. I've been travelling with my 13-year-old son who's had the advantage of going off to see all the beautiful sights of Istanbul this morning and we've been looked after so well. So thank you everyone for all your hospitality so far. So um, what I want to do is um, I want to try and weave together some strands of work I've been doing alongside the textbook Critical Thinking, A Concise Guide. I've been working on... Um, some problems around what we call deeply held beliefs. I've been working on responsible inquiry and on the role of emotion in reasoning, as well as, sorry, am I too, not loud enough? Okay, thank you. Um, and I've also been working on pe the pedagogy of critical thinking. Um, I do a lot of this work um, in collaboration with others, particularly with um, Justine Kingsbury, who's my colleague at Waikato, and also, of course, with Gary Kemp, who's my co-author on critical thinking. So some acknowledgement to them for their, their input into the ideas that I'm going to present today. The title, I thought I should tell you about the title. So this, t this slogan, truth is, the only we is our only weapon, um, I actually saw on a T-shirt. And um, I thought, well, that's a sort of motto for critical thinking, truth is our only weapon. Um, but I, I think this talk, in a way, is about... Um, you could think of what I'm going to say as about how we might best weaponise truth in the face of the weaponisation of ignorance. So that's the context for my title. So um, this is what I'll do. I'm going to start by thinking about some challenges to critical thinking that are posed by our contemporary situation. I'm going to talk about two problems within the pedagogy of critical thinking. So the problem of transfer and deeply held beliefs, which are very co interconnected problems. And then um, I'm going to do, introduce some ideas about responsible inquiry and how we might think about um, emotions and their role in, in uh, reasoning and argumentation. And uh, I have to confess that the first part of that is much better developed than the second part, so I'm still thinking about uh, quite a lot about the material on emotions and... Um, in the workshop tomorrow. Any of, anyone who's attending the workshop tomorrow will be able to help me out maybe with that. Um, so let's think about um, the present challenges in, in our contemporary global context. So um, critical thinking is often presented as transformative, as a source of empowerment or, of the individual and of organisations and of societies as a whole. And students often find that's the case. So when we teach critical thinking, and particularly when they start to learn about bad reasoning, when they start to learn about fallacies, and they see examples of fallacies that are used by, the power, by powerful people and by influential people, um, they start to see the way in which critical thinking um, provides a means of um, speaking truth to power and of giving them a voice and, and a, a, a voice of reason. Um, so, but I think that... Um, what we've come to refer to as the um, echo chamber makes this more important, sorry, makes this more difficult. So in the echo chamber that is provided for us by, partly by the ex massive expansion of social media, we choose our sources of information and current affairs. We choose who to follow on Twitter. We choose who to friend on Facebook if we haven't just withdrawn ourselves from Facebook in the light of recent events. Um, we choose which Reddit subjects, subgroups to join. 
So my own echo chamber rings daily with the sources of news and information that one might expect of a liberal academic, with, with the clamour of tweets um, with, uh, from the British Guardian newspaper, from the New York Times, headlines about the disasters of Brexit, of whoever um, President Trump has sacked recently, of po poisonings of people in the United Kingdom, of um, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, and the myriad of other ways in which the world is apparently um, uh, going wrong, if you like. So, so we have a problem. So what, what, one of the ways that we can look at what we face is that um, there's a problem of quality. It's much harder to control the quality of um, of our information about current affairs and world events. But there's also a problem of quantity. There are so many more sources than there used to be. Um, there's more coverage of current affairs and public discourse in a way, just the quantum is bigger, um, but it appears much faster, it's produced much faster, it's much harder to fact check it, and it's much harder to rebut. And, and, also, and, and another phenomenon we see is that um, if we don't like, so if, if I'm, um, for example, a politician, and I don't like what's in the mainstream media, then I can use social media to try and counteract it. So um, just this kind of, I'm thinking about this sort of clamour of um, sources that makes it harder for the critical reasoner to sort of navigate through, um, particularly the novice critical thinker. So in the, in the um, e echo chamber, we have this reinforcement of what we believe or what someone wants us to believe, and therefore, of course, the prevalence of confirmation bias. So, and this, of course, this isn't a problem that's gone unrecognised, at least in a very general sense. So, a couple of calls to arms. So, so um, this was uh, President Obama shortly after, um, so he wasn't in office anymore, this was um, early last year, and he said, if we're not serious about facts and what's true and what's not, if we can't discriminate between serious arguments and propaganda, then we have problems. And, and um, a quite a well-known passage from um, Hannah Arendt um, sort of sums up the consequences of ignoring that call to arms that, um, uh, that we hear from Obama. So Arendt wrote, the idle subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and the distinction between true and false no longer exist. So, What's to be done? So, what, well, what's to be done by people who care about critical and analytical thinking, by people like ourselves who teach critical thinking? You know, how, how, do we conf how do we take up that challenge, that call to arms? So, um, it's a question that I've been preoccupied with um, since... The, and I guess I was thinking I've always um, thought about the importance of teaching critical thinking in, a, in the context of real-world events. So um, sometimes in our textbooks, we resort to very simple um, and quite artificial examples as a way of explaining a difficult concept. Um, so you might use a very easy example to illustrate an um, example of a valid argument. Um, but the real value of critical thinking, as we saw from the um, video earlier, is in how it can um, empower us in our daily lives. And so we really need critical thinking pedagogy to work with real-world examples wherever possible. Um, so, so that's something that's always preoccupied me. But I've, I've been preoccupied specifically about this question about how does critical thinking contribute now, um, given the problems that we face globally and the problems that we face around... Of, um, in a post-truth, if you like, moment. And so that, that came really crystallised for me the morning after the Brexit vote, after the UK, um, in the referendum, there was the majority to leave the, United, the European Union. And I was visiting Germany at the time. And on the day of the referendum, um, I'd reassured my German friends that although opinion polls predicted a close result, on the basis of what I'd been reading, remember, back in my echo chamber, um, a pro-leave result seemed unlikely. Next day, when the result was clear, most Germans simply could not comprehend how things could have ended up that way, that the British could abandon the European project and retreat to their little Englander isolation. It seemed beyond the realms of reason. And so, as someone who teaches and writes about reason and argument, that really crystallised for me this question of what kind of response, what kind of effective intervention 
critical thinking in particular and educators in more general, sorry, more generally, could make in response to what I think could be life-changing, epoch-changing events. And, and of course, uh, around the, um, at the in the same year, the election, the election of um, Mr. Trump in the USA and um, other events since. Um, but I think that's, um, and I think it's, um, it's compelling to think that um, critical thinking pedagogy is adequate to this challenge. And, and indeed, you can see, I'm quoting myself up there, but only to see that that's something that, you know, I, have, I think myself that, um, that it can be adequate. But I think that the challenge is more complex and a bigger challenge than the sort of thing that we've said in our, in our book and sort of some of the things that we teach than they really imply. Um, it's not, and it's not just because of this post-truth moment, but it's also because of the problem of transfer, of the failure to elicit deep sense critical thinking um, as a result of our pedagogies. It's a long-standing problem with critical thinking pedagogy, um, and it really focuses on, th that problem really focuses on, or comes out of, the difficulties um, people have in applying critical thinking to their deeply held beliefs. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the challenge of, of, of deeply held beliefs, um, talk about what I think deeply held beliefs are. Um, I, the, it's really a, um, a philosopher who works on critical thinking, um, whose name is Richard Paul, who first um, started thinking, to, coined this phrase, strong think, sense critical thinking. And it's critical thinking that operates at a level of criticality um, at which we're able to apply processes of critical thinking and argumentation assessment to our own beliefs and commitments. So it's, um, and particularly towards our deeply held beliefs and are able to remove any bias towards or in favour of our own beliefs. So if you like, if, if you will, it's critical, turning critical thinking inwards. Um, if critical thinking is to become a genuine life skill in the way that it was described um, in, the, in the video, and if it's to equip us to participate in our communities and our societies in the ways that we hope we can and we, in the ways that we tell our students they'll be able to, um, if, it's then, if it's properly to become an aspect of our ability to reason practically, which after all is what critical thinking is in a way, it's, it's pra practical reasoning in the classical sense, um, then we need to overcome the challenge of deeply held beliefs and become um, deep, strong sense critical thinkers. So um, we, with, with a team of some researchers at Waikato, we conducted a very small project um, where, we, where we looked at, where we, um, we worked with students who had taken a first year critical thinking course. And um, our course is one semester, so 12 weeks of tuition, two weeks of two additional weeks of study. And we interviewed them about the extent that their, their think, the extent to which their thinking had become more critical after having completed the course. And we also asked them about the extent to which their thinking about their deeply held beliefs, their reflection on their deeply held beliefs, had become more critical. And then we explored the question in more depth by um, setting up conversations in which, so it was sort of like an interview, but tried to make it more relaxed so it became a conversation, in which they were in encouraged to use critical thinking skills to reflect on and defend their own deeply held beliefs. And the overwhelming result was that although participants would say at the beginning that they thought that they would become more critical as a result of studying critical thinking, it turned out that only a minority were able or willing to properly reflect on their own, on their own beliefs. Um, so to, to reflect critically. Um, they tended to, to defend their beliefs using fallacies, um, often with appeals to tradition, so a version of historic fallacy, um, or by employing a naturalistic fallacy. So as you might imagine, as somebody who had been um, teaching critical thinking at that point for about 18 years and had published already three editions of a textbook that was quite widely taught, um, that gave me a certain pause for thought and quite considerable unease because we didn't appear to be successful in enabling students to, to develop this aspect of practical wisdom. Um, but, and, and, and another sort of aspect of that unease 
is that that um, expectation that transforming deeply held beliefs might be achieved by the standard pedagogies and approaches that we use um, might have been naive and unreasonable in itself. So as we ran those interviews, um, quite a number of participants talked about beliefs that, I hope this idiom works in Turkish, let's see, that they had imbibed with their mother's milk. Does that, does that translate in Turkish? Okay, all right. So um, beliefs that had formed part of the framework within which they thought about and sought to understand the world, part of the ethos with which they engaged with the world and with others. Um, in some other philosophical, philosophical traditions, you might call it the habitus. So that illustrated the way in which um, deeply held beliefs are often uh, held and defended passionately um, and that there's a kind of emotional attachment to our deeply held beliefs. And I'm going to return to that as I start to work through the challenges shortly. But before I do that, I think it's probably useful to just talk a little bit about um, what deeply what we mean by deeply held beliefs and um, again my colleague Justin Kingsbury and I have done some work on this so so the, here's some examples of what some people they're not all my beliefs um, they're things propositions that someone might hold as a deeply held belief and um, I don't think that there's any necessary or sufficient condition for a belief to be deeply held um, deeply held beliefs are acquired in various ways their contents diverse We've tried to identify some markers, some of them are present, but they need not necessarily be. So um, it may be held and defended passionately, it may be held and defended dogmatically, it may play a fundamental role in the way we represent the world to ourselves, it might form part of our symbolic framework, our ways of being in the world, and our ways of influencing our own actions and our actions of others. Um, a deeply held belief tends not to be brought to mind on a regular basis. So we're not sort of patrolling the world, interacting with each other, with our deeply held beliefs really at the forefront of our minds. Um, we're not particularly conscious of them until we call them into, into question or we take a moment to reflect upon them. So... But there is, I think, as we saw from our research and our conversations with our former students, there, is, um, some, there are connections between emotion, there's a connection between emotions and the way that we often, often hold deeply held beliefs. So um, we, we are often, as I said, sorry, I've repeated this, emotionally attached. This may be because of the way we've acquired and re, re, required our deeply held beliefs, sorry, acquired, and reinforce them via our upbringing, by people who've been influential in our lives, our parents, our other family members, teachers, religious and cultural leaders, or they've come, we've acquired them through our social and professional peers, or because they've been formed on the basis of lived experiences that serve consistently to reinforce them. So that's a sort of confirmation bias. They're part of the mythology that provides a, the narrative environment within, within which our cognitive and effective de development take place. So we feel invested in such beliefs, and they form part of our identity. Unsurprisingly then, given the ways in which we tend to be inquired, acquired, and given our unwillingness to subject them to critical scrutiny, deeply held beliefs are, project, uh, are prone to prejudice, to implicit bias, to confirmation bias, to stereotype, and to stereotypes. They're easily manipulated. Our tendency to cling tightly to them, coupled with an unwillingness to subject them to reflection, demonstrates a lack of open-mindedness, a lack of op openness to entertaining other different points of view and, resu and a resulting res resistance to change. And of course, there's emotional and social comfort in holding on to beliefs shared by those around us and with whom we regularly interact. If our friends, both far and wide, our neighbours, our family, our colleagues, express and share the same view that, um, as us, for example, that... Um, so I've chosen, deliberately chosen an example that's quite a prejudiced view to push the point, point home. So, so if everybody around you shares the view that um, migrants are stealing jobs, that they push wages down, that they're the cause of increased crime, and so on, then that position is entrenched in our social interactions and understanding of the world. And we take an emotional and social risk if we attempt to challenge that view within the, um, those social um, and, prof and sometimes professional circles as well. <coughs> 
Um, so, and, and on top of that, our beliefs and opinions are reinforced in the echo chambers of our social media feeds. These echo chambers shelter us from socio-cultural and political difference. Their digital dislo dislocatedness shields us from encounter with the distant other who is demonised in the absence of any challenge to our prejudices and fears that could be gained from the experience um, of actual embodied encounter with those people different from us. So as Plato reminds us, the illusions of the cave offer more comfort than the confrontations of reality. And so, but, but um, if we turn to, so staying slightly, just for a second, within the ancient tradition, um, if we turn to an Aristotelian uh, notion of um, intellectual virtue, then, um, then there, we have a way out of um, our tendency to remain within the shelter of the cave, I think. And so uh, I'm going to now move gently into talking about um, responsible inquiry. So um, I like to start um, with this passage from a Canadian philosopher, um, Lorraine Code. And th but this is very much a um, pretty standard Aristotelian account of the intellectually virtuous person. Who's one, who is one who finds value in knowing and understanding how things really are, who resists the temptation to live with partial explanations where fuller ones are attainable, who resists the temptation to live in fantasy or in a world of dreams or illusion, consider it better to know, despite the tempting comfort and complacency that a life of fantasy or illusion, or well tinged with fantasy or illusion, can offer. So there's that sense of um, not being satisfied with the illusions of the shadows and um, having... Um, having the courage, the intellectual courage, if you like, um, to face the, the sun and the truth. So what Code also captures here is the motivational elements of being a good inquirer. That's something else that was mentioned in the um, video, the need to be motivated to be a critical thinker all of the time. So it's not just so, so critical thinking, or sorry, so being a virtuous inquirer, is not just a matter of inquiring, acquiring skills of inquiry and applying them well, but being motivated to, to do so, to be motivated to seek knowledge and understanding. In similar vein, um, to, so, in, so um, I'm going to make a connection shortly between this and um, what I refer to as a transfer gap and the problem of applying critical thinking to um, deeply held beliefs. Um, but I thought I'd just provide just, short, just a very brief background um, to work on um, virtue in argumentation and virtue in epistemology. So, um, in, in a similar vein to virtue-oriented trends in epistemology, some recent work in argumentation theory reor reorients an understanding of good argument away from standard accounts, whereby, generally speaking, cogency is the measure of good argument, and towards accounts according to which what counts as whether the argument... what counts as to whether the argument is good is whether the argument is virtuous in producing the argument. So the, f the focus shifts away from the argument itself and onto the agent. So there's a parallel um, with virtue theory and ethics and with some versions of virtue epistemologies. So, and, and in that parallel, virtue becomes constitutive of good argument. And again, mirroring virtue epistemology, virtues of argumentation include both reliabilist and responsibilist traits. I'll talk about that shortly. So, but in a series of papers that I've written um, with Justine Kingsbury, we've argued that while the virtues associated with virtuous inquiry have a crucial play to, role to play in ensuring that we argue well, or at least better, um, standard conceptions of good argument, so those standard conceptions where good argument is really a matter of cogency, they still trump the virtu virtuous argument in terms of defining good argument. So, so what we think is that while arguing virtually, sorry, virtuously is desirable and in most cases does lead to better inquiry, it's neither necessary nor sufficient for good argument. So we, we're making a distinction between the practice of arguing, which we say do this virtuously, and the argument itself. And arguably the, the full-blown virtue argumentation theorist collapses these together. So... Um, the, probably the best known um, virtue argumentation theorist who holds that very full-blown view where a good argument is the one that the virtuous argue would give um, is 
um, Andrew Aberdeen, who works out of um, uh, uni Florida Technical University, I think it is. Um, and we have very um, cordial discussions with, between ourselves and him about this, um, what really the role of virtue is. But just to be clear, um, my view is that um, virtue uh, can bring a lot to um, our understanding of what it is to argue well as a practice, um, but I don't think that what constitutes a good argument is simply an argument that has been, um, is the argument that the virtuous arguer would put. So I said I would talk a little bit about these virtues. Um, so following from virtue epistemology, um, there, there are two, generally considered to be two kind of classes of virtues. So the reliability of virtues, which are essentially um, cognitive and perceptual abilities, they're natural abilities, but it's possible to develop and Im improve them. Um, and um, arguably, with respect to reasoning, so with respect to those, the ability to reason deductively and inductively, that's one of the principal goals of critical thinking, simply is to um, teach people to take that natural ability and to hone it and turn it into um, a, a strong skill. So I, I guess for what I'm going to talk about here, um, the responsibilist um, virtues are more important and to me they're more interesting. Um, this is a slightly abridged list that um, we borrow from a philosopher, a philosopher called Linda Zabzebski who's done a lot of work um, on virtue epistemology, but we think um, this is a good set of responsiveness virtues for argumentation. Um, so I haven't been reading through my slides because I wanted them just to be summaries, but I will just run through this list. So the ability to recognise the salient facts and weigh them up properly as evidence, sensitivity to detail, open-mindedness, fairness, epistemic humility, perseverance, diligence, um, care and thoroughness, the ability to recognise reliable authority, um, intellectual candour, so sort of honesty, intellectual courage, autonomy and creativeness and creativity and inventiveness. Um, so these, um, in, in inquiry these virtues um, or dispositions if you prefer, I'm not wedded to the language of virtue, um, they're regulatory. Um, they regulate the use of our cognitive skills. They tell us when to, um, when to apply and when to pull back, how to, how to establish a sort of uh, working mean or golden mean between the virtue and the, its um, corresponding vice. So they constrain our cognitive and communicative exchanges. They enable us to treat others properly and to take proper account of the contributions that each person makes to an inquiry. So, um, and returning to the... Um, the passage that I showed you from Lorraine Code, also um, returning to the video that we saw earlier, practice of these um, dispositions or skills is required and practice takes motivation. So there needs to be a sort of general motivation to um, reason well to be a critical thinker all or almost all of the time. So, and the transfer gap, so the transfer gap is what we see in the research that we conducted with our former students. The transfer gap is, a, in a, and it's well documented in the literature, so it's the inability um, to transfer the skills of the classroom, the critical thinking classroom, to real world everyday situations, so to life. So when, when we tell ourselves that critical thinking is a life skill, when employers and um, university administrators talk about the importance of um, critical thinking as a, it's often called a soft skill. Um, they're thinking of it as something that students will, uh, will take forward into the professional lives and into their communities and so on, as become part of their lives. Um, but the research around the transfer gap demonstrates that, that very often that doesn't happen. So, um, and the transfer gap is, I think, a part, in part a lack of motivation, of being able to be bothered to engage properly with an argument especially if it's a complex argument or it's poorly expressed or it's delivered in... It's also to do with delivery. It might be delivered in a way that's threatening or aggressive and our, our inclination then is just to turn away from the argument and not to engage. So um, I always think that quite a useful analogue when we're thinking about motivation and critical thinking um, is with um, sports. In sports, we start with our... Uh, as an athlete, we start with our natural cognitive and physical faculties and we develop and hone specific skills depending on what kind of 
um, sporting or athletic activity we're taking part in. But that's not enough on its own. We need persistence, we need courage, humility and so on um, as athletes um, and determination to carry on in the, you know, in the face of difficulty and so on. And, and often, it's interesting, if you, if you watch a lot of sport on TV, and I, I notice that football and basketball are big things here, um, and I already knew that football was, and, and I've learned about basketball a bit. Um, but if you watch sport, it's very often interesting that one of the things that commentators, um, especially if you watch individual sports, so I watch a lot of tennis, and commentators will often um, comment on the emotional state of, of the athlete. You know, so it's, as we all know, it's not just about um, being fit and being skilled, but it's also about um, how you're approaching things in terms of persistence and, um, and motivation. So, now I had, I'm, I'm a little unsure about the time, and I have a big case study that I was going to work through, and I think I'm going to skip that and save that um, for the workshop. And does that sound like it? Okay, good. So, so um, what does all that mean? What does all this mean for our pedagogy and critical thinking? So, um, I think it means that we need to be explicit as teachers about developing habits of responsible inquiry. And I think we need to be explicit about that right from the very beginning. And in the new edition, we're writing a new edition of Critical Thinking, and I'm going to have a go, in the I'm going to try in the first chapter to address this. So when it comes out, you'll be able to see whether I've managed it. Um, we need to be recognise the role of open-mindedness in being willing to examine our own deeply held beliefs. So um, a preparedness, so where we understand open-mindedness as a preparedness to relinquish, to give up our own beliefs. Um, we need to recognise the role of epistemic humility, listening to others, being open to others, uh, to learning from others. The role of judging appropriate um, deference to authority, courage to examine, to challenge, and to develop our own autonomy. So, the, the problem of transfer and the problem of deeply held belief, they... Um, Oops. Okay, so um, they present us with challenges. Um, there's a recognition. So, so there's a sort of there's a recognition of the value of of a general recognition amongst educators, in, in to, amongst employers, and so on, that um, critical thinking skills and inst in instruction are of value. And it's it's true that in our courses, learners acquire the skills. But we see less evidence of turning critical thinking inwards and being properly critical of ourselves. And it's very difficult for critical thinking to loosen the gap, the grip of deeply held beliefs. I think that's in part because of an emotional attachment to those beliefs that's not easily shifted through reasoning. And I've suggested that, um, I've started to suggest that a virtue or virtue oriented approach may better motivate learners to think critically outside of and beyond the classroom. Now I want briefly to discover the role of emotion, and then I'm going to bring them both together in um, one example, one example from a teacher in the United States. So, generally, um, emo in, in argumentation theory and critical reasoning, the tradition is that emotion is juxtaposed to reasoning, to reason, and there's a whole family of juxtapositions that you can see there that I've represented in the cha chart. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that rhetoric's the answer, so I'm not saying, oh, well, Everyone's emotionally attached to their beliefs, so let's give up critical reasoning and let's resort to rhetoric. Um, but some argumentation theorists, notably um, Michael Gilbert and Maureen Linker, um, interestingly both Canadians, I don't know why that is, but um, argue for the legitimacy of emotion with, within reasoning and argument. They think that emotion is not necessarily a hindrance to good reasoning. On the one hand, fear and anger may undermine good reasoning, for example. But on, other, on the other, they might be warranted responses to a situation and have a role to play in effective practical reasoning. Linker, for example, points out that indignation and anger is often the rational response to instances of social injustice. It can tra trigger appropriate actions and change the way we think about the world. So when we evaluate someone's route to a conclusion, which at base is what we do when we assess argument, it's rational to take emotion into account. Or it can be context your question. Um, moreover, choice theory suggests that emotion plays an increasingly significant role in our decision making. The more, the, the more important the decision is in the scheme of life, 
and our ways of living, the more significant the role of emotion. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Maureen Linker's work. I think um, Linker's work in her book, Intellectual Empathy, Critical Thinking for Social Justice, offers us a, offers a way out of this impasse. Um, it offers an approach to, um, to a discussion of socially divisive issues, the sorts of things that we often hold deeply held beliefs about. Um, that's drawn from her own practice um, and sorry it's drawn from her own practice of, as an educator of negotiating methods for effective and potentially transformative discussions of socially divisive issues which often take place against extensive social, cultural and political difference I, I would argue that when Critical thinking is performed as Linker suggests, and as her case studies demonstrate, she does, and she, her case studies demonstrate that she does a really good job in facilitating that with her students. It manifests traits and responsibilities and practices that realise intellectual responsibility. Um, it is virtuous argumentation. Um, at the centre, it's inclusive of diversity and it provides a fuller picture of social issues, if you like, gives us a fuller understanding of the person with whom we're communicating, and a reconnection of um, argument with the reality of lived experiences. And at the centre um, of her, and hence the title of the book, at the centre of her approach is her idea of intellectual empathy, so it's a sort of um, another um, virtue of inquiry. Um, assumes that reason and understanding can, must be supplemented with emotional experience so that we can know in the fullest possible sense. This means knowing about ourselves and knowing as much as we can about other people's circumstances, particularly those whose circumstances are different. Um, in this way, in, intellectual empathy is not a psychological prescription. It's a means of examining both the wide scope of social institutions and social inequality in the narrow scope of our own beliefs. When we employ intellectual empathy in our reasoning about social difference, we're not so much interested to gather... In, Sorry, I didn't correct that typo. In gathering information about people and their respective beliefs as we are looking at situations people face through their, through their eyes. So her thought is that we bring that into reasoning. It's, um, that, um, without doing that, we exclude many voices and we lose a diversity of voices. It's... Um, Linker also emphasises the need for responsible listening. So, as a way to close and bring all that together, I'm going to bring, um, I'm going to talk about an example from a high, a, a high school in Ohio. And I, I think this will make it sort of, um, this wasn't what the teacher was trying to do, but I think it demonstrates both um, making room for emotion and some of the um, intellectual virtues that I've been talking about. So, um, there was a, uh, I found this in the New York Times, so I can give people a link to it if they're interested. So, um, there was a, a chap who was a science teacher um, in a coal mining district of Ohio. Um, and he, and he was, had 17 students in senior biology. And um, they were all, um, for want of a better way of describing it, at that point, climate change sceptics. They had... Um, family members who'd lost jobs in the coal mines. So it was a very economically depressed area. Um, and they formed deeply held beliefs. Their deeply held beliefs were that emissions from burning fossil fuels were not causally responsible for climate change. That's probably a bit, slightly simplistic way of capturing that belief, but they were um, sceptical. Um, they, um, they had formed those deeply held beliefs um, in the environments of their families and their communities. Their loyalty to their family and community meant that their affective response outweighed their cognitive responses um, that were elicited by data and other evidence that they were being shown. So the teacher was using scientific evidence in the way that we would all think we would all approach it naturally as critical thinkers and teachers of critical thinking, and he was um, using data, and, and it wasn't working. He was getting no traction at all with these students. And some, some of the students' responses were quite extreme. There was a student who left the class and refused ever to come back. There were students who were arguing very vociferously and very emotionally with him. Um, that, and that, you know, that they took this very personally because of what had happened in their communities. So the teacher made a switch 
away from trying to work directly against their beliefs um, by dis trying to disprove their beliefs with scientific evidence and with data. He appealed to their lived experience of the local climate. He, he showed them, or he, he reminded them, that winter brought sn fewer snow days, and, and on snow days often their school was closed, um, that the spring brought more floods. He reinforced that by creating new lived experiences. He took students to the woods where they observed the de destructive effects of, invasive, of an invasive insect that had died off in the winter but now survives through the warmer winters and destroys the trees. So he recognised the emotional weight of the students' beliefs about climate change and their suspicion of so scientific evidence. And instead of presenting more and more st st statistical evidence as though they might eventually bow under its weight, he enabled an immediate experience, he made it real for them. And in doing that, he gave them a way to see and to feel what the data represented. So he acknowledged the role of emotion and eventually, and it was a, it was a struggle for him, this wasn't what he did at the very beginning, but eventually, instead of working, um, working directly against it and risking reinforcing it, he, um, he used it to open students up to reasoning. And notice that he's not appealing to some other emotion there, but he's using, he's recognising their emotion, he's then working with their experience, he's giving them new experience, providing them with new, notice it's new empirical evidence, and then they start to make sense of the data, and they do start to relinquish their own deeply held beliefs. And so I think also there we're seeing um, evidence of the exercise of some of those intellectual traits. So... Um, he, the teacher, um, is exercising what Linker calls intellectual empathy there. He's, he's trying to see things through the eyes of the students, trying to work out why they have the deeply do, held beliefs that they do in order to, to work through them to the students. So as a teacher, he's exercising intellectual humility. He's willing to learn from his students. Um, the students start to develop intellectual autonomy. They start to move away from those deeply held beliefs that they've got from their fa acquired from their families and their communities. Um, they become more open-minded. They start to entertain the possibility of holding a view that's actually quite opposed to the one that they currently um, they that they currently hold. The teacher demonstrates perseverance. This was a very if you go and look more deep, if you go and look in more detail at what he writes about this. This was a long struggle for him as an educator. Um, he, um, the, stu the students, there's an interesting um, inability at first of the students to recognise authority. So they don't recognise the authority of experts, but they start to move towards that. So there's, an, in, there's a sort of good example of, of some vices here as well. Um, and they start to become able, once they um, start to move beyond their emotional responses, they become able to weigh up evidence, particularly when the evidence is presented to them empirically by this experience in the woods. So I've argued that um, transformational learning experience that involve performing open-mindedness with respect to one's own shibboleth re require more than developing good reasoning skills. They also require acquiring habits of responsible inquiry. They require acknowledgement that deeply held beliefs can be motivated by emotional responses that are not unjustified and that our affective responses, our emotional responses to certain situations can themselves be reasonable responses. In order better to make space for emotion as part and parcel of transformative social inquiry and critique in the educational context, it seems to me that we should be offering learners more opportunities for encounter with the other, for experiential and immersive learning that both amplifies and challenges the theoretical and undermines popular media narratives and representation of the other. Um, so I think that while, so while we should indeed remain serious about facts and about what's true and what's not, this moment of post-truth, and let's work as educators, scholars and activists to ensure that it is just a moment of post-truth. It doesn't become an epoch or an era. But this moment requires us also to take affective responses as seriously as cognitive ones and to find ways to elicit new imaginative responses in critical thinking and analytic analytical thinking that confront misrepresentation, dissembling and lies. Thank you very much. Oh, and. Great. I would like to thank you, um, Dr. Powell and Bowell, and um, I would like to invite um, Rector Yalchin on stage to um, present you a gift.
Thank you so much, Dr. Babo. That was a very eye-opening speech.